Hello, and welcome to the Justice and Coffee podcast, the podcast where we discuss a variety of justice-related issues affecting the world over a cup of coffee. This week, my guest is the award-winning photojournalist and filmmaker Hazel Thompson. Hazel has spent 20-plus years working as a journalist and has produced work for Channel 4 News, The Guardian, and The New York Times, to name but a few. A great deal of Hazel's journalism has been focused around issues of injustice. She's covered stories on armed conflicts in Africa. She's written about the incarceration, the illegal incarceration of children in the Philippines, and the, the trafficking of women into the sex industry in India. We're going to touch on a few of those subjects in this podcast, and it's on that point that I want to issue a bit of a warning. Some of the content of our discussion is quite graphic and could be disturbing or upsetting to hear. So I would ask you to bear that in mind when listening and perhaps choose a time and a place where you can listen to this one in private. If you're anything like my mother, who refuses to watch any film with a certificate higher than a 12A, this may not be the podcast for you. But please know that some of these stories really need to be heard, and I'm particularly grateful to Hazel for coming on the podcast and sharing them with us. She very rarely does these, and I think we're really fortunate to have her on the show, so without any further ado, here's Hazel. Hazel, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on the show. Pleasure. Like everybody um, that I invite on, the first thing I want to know is about your coffee drinking habits. You're a coffee drinker, right? I am a coffee drinker and lover. That is good to hear. We had Julia on the other day. She and doesn't drink. She's, she's a friend of mine. She doesn't drink coffee. Never, she's a matcha girl. Never no. had a coffee. So if I'm with her, I have to drink matcha. But I like matcha, but yeah, I'm a coffee girl. Good girl. What what, what do you go for if you have a choice? I, I'm a flat white, but I'm actually, sadly, I'm dairy, dairy intolerant. So I have oat milk, but oat milk is very nice. Or I just, just go black, basically. Because yes. I just don't, I want to be able to taste the coffee properly. And not dilute the. Flavor. I completely. I mean, you're making all the right noises, Hazel. This is you've already started well. We're drinking some black coffee today out of a cafetiere from El Salvador. What it's do you think great. to it? Is it it's, right? It is chocolatey. You said it would be, and a little nutty. Ah, how's that for a sound effect? <laughs> so it's morning. We're in central London. We've got some croissants. I've got a banana for you. Please dig into that during the during option. during our podcast, our time together. I really wanted to um, get you in, but, uh, mainly because of your, your your role and your involvement in these issues, to, uh, in justice-related issues, but actually from a slightly different perspective to maybe how one would imagine you to get involved in the work of human trafficking, slavery, issues of corruption, as a journalist, as a photojournalist, as a, as a filmmaker. Um, so that's what I, I, I wanted to get your perspective uh, on these issues. But really, I wanted to know, you know, where did that start? Did it start at university? Did it start, um, you know, later in life? Or, you know, where did, where did that journey for you begin, if that makes sense? In visual storytelling or justice or both? Both, That's yeah. That's both. Well, yeah. I think the journey for justice for me, um, I, I've always uh, been uh, that way inclined, I think. I've always, ha I've ha always had a dislike for injustice. And so even when I was... Um, younger or just just um, my mother always calls me a rescuer mm. so since I've been a little girl I've literally rescued injured animals <laughs> or anyone that looks like they need to be loved and, uh. and have a home and every holiday if there was a stray cat I would bring a stray cat home um, so I think there's all that's it literally has been in me since I was a little girl I mean I yeah I, I even my poor mother would be like waiting always like what what she bought now because i'd be like mom <laughs> we need to help something yeah. um and even one time i i bought what i thought was a stray cow um home in a bottom field near where i grew up in surrey i mean it was a very unwell cow and it did actually need help but my poor mother um as you can imagine yeah she she was always like oh no it was it was a constant and even actually i could tell you something funny for her 70th birthday we organized a really special birthday meal at a beaverbrook um hotel which is a big famous journalism okay. hotel from the old days and we go in and uh there's a sick bunny rabbit with mixed mitosis, and I had to obviously deal with that first to make sure that they took care of that before I went in the meal. My mother was Because you like, couldn't enjoy it otherwise, No, right? I couldn't. I'll be thinking that about the little funny <laughs> rabbit. Anyway, so the, the little girl in me is still there. And then photojournalism, I have um, always been an artist. I was a painter when I was a little girl. Um, I was, when I was doing... Uh, 
the start of GCSE art. I was taught by a teacher at school how to use a, an old 1970s camera, fell in love mm. with photography and um, started using it for my preliminary, preliminary studies as in my art. And literally it just became my obsession mm. and started using the camera, started studying photography. And then when I um, was... I was I went to a very academic school and your future is planned. Mm, mm. And yeah, they, I had one of those. You, it didn't, you it didn't those. get me very far. Didn't get but, well. Yeah. Um, and my family all about, which is great, university education. I think every one of my family's gone to uni, which is incredible. And it, you know the fact that I even had that opportunity, but I really knew what I wanted to do, and so. Um, I wanted to become a, a photographer. Uh, you I wanted knew to that, a, that early. I knew that. I, I knew. By about the age of um, 17, I didn't probably know photojournalism until I, I'd had some work experience and I was like, yes, I'm born to do this. Mm. But yeah, I knew quite early. So I literally turned around to, you know, my parents who really were like, well, you're going to go to university and then, you know, study a, a normal, you know, really good general subject. Right. You know, hopefully meet a nice up and coming hedge funder at yes. uni, get married. <laughs> Uh, move to the suburbs. Two point one children. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, the state. none of it. No. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So I left school at eighteen, moved out of home, moved up to London, and um, I had a really amazing opportunity because actually the week I finished school, the next week I had work experience at the local paper, oh, cool. which was the Croydon Advertiser. And by the end of that week, I was like, "This is what I'm going to wow. do." So I, I've been, you know, I've been really clear on my kind of purpose and calling from quite young. Yeah. And I'm grateful for that. Absolutely. Right. And I love it. I mean, I'm basically being paid to do something I'm passionate about. Yeah. And um, I still pinch myself every every assignment I go on. And um, it just feels, it's just, even when things are hard, I'm, I'm yeah, I, I'm beyond grateful. I'm doing what I love. Yeah. What a blessing that is to, to, to have established that so early in your life. And without wanting to give your age away, so if you were you sort of fine, getting no, no. into that at 18, like you've, you've had a few years. In I'm, I'm 40, so I've been doing this for 22 years. Wow, amazing. Majority, yeah, over half my life. Because we, we, this is not the first time we met, right? We met each no. other on a bizarre night uh, in Washington, D.C., um, doing doing that walk. Um, what's it called? Were we you, did a tour of the monuments. The monuments we? walk at night time. You got to see them by night. So they're all lit up. There's there's statues, obviously Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King, and these. Um, it's a pretty pretty nice experience. We had some mutual friends, didn't we? And yeah, I, and you were straight out of Haiti, weren't you? The Dominican Republic, and I remember. Oh, Dominican Republic. Sorry, I <laughs> no, get that wrong. <laughs> I did. I did <laughs> spend a tiny amount of time in Haiti, but it was more of a tourist, really. But yeah, I was transiting back to the UK, and I hadn't heard an English voice for so long. And then I bumped into to yourself, so it was great to to meet you under those circumstances. Well, what were you doing there? How did we? Cross so by? I. Um, so that was our connection through IJM. Yeah. Who I know you're supporting, which is some, mm. which is amazing. And I I've got friends at IJM as well. And I was straight off the bat. I was about to come back to the UK after living in the US for three months, writing a book. I got a journalism residency in upstate New York. So I went via DC to, yeah, uh, see friends at the Nat Geo, um, to connect with IJM for an event they were doing as yeah. well. Um, yeah, and we, oh, I'd never forget that because, yeah, we're walking, we're walking by the lakes. And also, I'm not like used to kind of chat I haven't been in that I've been writing but suddenly yeah. it's like hey as well another <laughs> British accent and then I think both of us were a bit like what are we doing walking around yeah I think we tried You're to in... condense a good several days worth of chat into about half an yeah. hour it's just sort of... and all these sto- and also f- very similar stories because mm. obviously you've done uh, what you've done in, in your work uh, working for IJM and I think we've had some very similar experiences mm. of you know I've been on a lot of raids and I've been mm working long-term in uh, red light districts. And I think, yeah, with sex trafficking particularly, uh, we, we had it was, it was nice to speak to someone you understood. Mm. It, was quite, it was random. <laughs> it becomes a relatively esoteric uh, sort of conversation to have, isn't it, when you're talking yeah. about issues of human trafficking, yeah. sex trafficking from maybe a frontline view. But, well, actually, one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast because I've met um, so many people like yourself that have these amazing testimonies and, and stories about how they got involved in it. I just think, whoa, this is an amazing story. I'd love to share this with people. If only I could just press record on the conversation that I've had with some. Well, let's do that. You know, let's bring them back and, and have them again. 
with a pair of headphones on <laughs> so in the natural. studio. In, in that, I was quite excited actually today because when we started yes. recording, I wouldn't mention who, but there was a, a well-known a, musician, a well-known rock band that happened to be here being interviewed for something. Else, I didn't so. recognise them. Yeah, I had to write I could, it. I could probably recognise the dictators of the world, but no, I didn't recognise <laughs> him. And I was like, what? Oh, okay. In a clandestine fashion, I sort of typed it onto my phone. Hey, so look over there. <laughs> look who it is. <laughs> I um, I, so I, undercover. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll always, always unnecessarily. So. Should you signal? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Should have smoked it over to you. <laughs> so the Croydon advertiser was was where life began um, in your journalistic South career. South London. South London, yeah, my, my territory these days. Oh, excuse me, I just bashed, <laughs> bashed the microphone. How, so how did that come about? Um, you know, I... It's it get really random, really. So I was doing photography for my A level, and I was actually dating a guy who went to he was older than me. Went to Hong Kong to break his career in acting. He was mm. a kung fu artist, and uh, I did a big kind of my own, a photo project out in Hong Kong, photographing um, just uh, life around uh, just the culture and the life. Anyway, for a project, and then I exhibited it in a little cafe in my last year of A-levels, and the Croydon advertiser came to photograph my little exhibition. And I met I, uh, uh, Kevin, uh, this uh, lovely photojournalist. He's like, hey, do you want to come and have work experience at the Croydon advertiser? And I hadn't thought of photojournalism. I didn't, you know, I didn't know anyone or anything. So, yeah. So, literally, I left school on the Friday, and I was doing work experience on the Monday at the Croydon advertiser with good old Kevin, who was my first mentor and is still a really... Uh, dear friend, and um, it all it it all began as I said. But by the end of the week, I was like, "Yeah, this is what I want to do." So it was it was just an incredible opportunity. Which and and it, and you know, I had to grow into you know when you haven't studied photojournalism. I didn't know who the great photographers were. I knew the photography I loved, and I grew up. My dad used to have literally National Geographic since the nineteen sixties, which again was a huge influence on me. Um, Loved pouring through those as a kid. And he used to get the Sunday Times magazine, which did amazing photo Mm. essays. So I knew actually quite a bit about photography. I just didn't know the names. Mm. Um, So when I was at the Croydon Advertiser, there was, I don't know how, but I was doing some PR photography and, you know, working for a local paper. Let's get straight. At the time, they're not, you know, they've really scaled down now. But 22 years ago, there was like 13 editions. I covered from far over as kind of Epsom, right over to kind of Bromley, south down to Gatwick and right up to the edge of London, um, up to central London. And it was amazing. You know, Thornton Heath was a bit, you know, there'd be things going on and burnt out cars (laughs) in areas. And obviously, sadly, a lot of gang stuff. So you're covering hard stories. And then you do a lot of festivals and kiddies going down slides. And Christmas time is a lot of... Anyway, so you're doing that kind of work. But then a door opened for me um, to go and see a guy who worked at the Express newspaper. And I never forget turning up my little portfolio, which was just a very basic local paper. Mm -hmm. And he gave me a real hard time. He's like... because you get a hard time as a woman as well in this okay. world and he kind of was like I don't think you're hard enough for this but you know I'll give you an opportunity um, there's to meet our chief photographer this guy called John Downing and we, we, he telephoned him up and said uh, uh, look will you will you meet this girl give her some work experience we go straight down to the office and I meet John Downing I'll be honest I didn't know him by name but I did know his pictures okay. which I worked out and he took me under his wing um, I ended up driving him to a lot of stories uh, he let me just shadow him, got amazing work experience, not only just first hand on projects, he took me out, I got to meet people in the journalism world. I mean, I had no access to it because mm. I hadn't gone through the system right. or knew anyone. And through him, he kind of opened doors, but big more enough than anything. It's not even about that he trained me. Um, the biggest thing is he believed in me. Amazing. And he believed in my work and just gave me time and mentored me properly. Yeah. And it's really because of him that... Uh, you know, it was it was a ma- that was a major point for me yeah. in my career. Mentorship is such oh, a so key. If you can get that in your life, whatever industry you're in, what passion you're in, find someone with a wealth of experience that's willing to sort of invest a little bit of that in you. That's and and I love going start, the other it? way now. I really love trying mm. to mentor young photographers. Um, filmmakers and I do a lot of workshops. Actually, one joyful thing I was—I mean, I'm an arts ambassador for the British Council for years, 
And I've got to run workshops in the Middle East. Um, I, I ran one like one of the first female photojournalism workshops. And I had Yemeni photographers and Saudi Arabia, uh, girls mm. from Saudi Arabia. One of the girls that I trained in uh, from Yemen is actually in Sana'a now and reporting on uh, the war. And, wow. and that's just pure joy. And yeah. especially women. I love mentoring other female photographers not that you know if a young person comes and they're keen but it's yeah. it's it and it's harder now to get in the industry it's, yeah. it's much harder than it was for me and um it's harder to get enough work full time just because people don't pay yeah. you know journalism doesn't have as much money as i was going to say i mean 20 odd years working in in you know in the trade you must have seen a significant difference or a significant change in the way we conduct or we, we go about journalism now from that waiting for the papers to come out in the yeah. morning and be delivered to just having it on your phone yeah i mean it's, 24 7. it's hard now because people i don't don't people understand what work and money goes into quality journalism mm. and people expect everything instantly and you know probably we're trained ethically you know you've got to check your sources you you know you've got to double check that things are factually actually right and banging your hand I'm banging on the table. my hand because I believe I get very passionate <laughs> don't I um so yeah you know good journalism costs money and I mean if you look at the New York Times now they're doing this whole truth campaign and um it's 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 changed a lot um but it's more just that there's less it, it, you know, in the olden days you'll be sending much sent in much longer to do an assignment and now budgets are tighter so you know for example it's really hard. As a journalist, I'm going in, and you know, like for New York Times, I work with a writer, so I'm alongside them. We're, you know, we're, we're going to Congo for DRC for two weeks, and you're covering rape as a weapon of war, which is, mm. you know, complex, big issue, in depth. It can take you eight hours to travel to one village, mm. um, off road in a war zone with security, you know, protection from. Um, the UN and it's not easy to then double check sources and yeah. you know this it, this takes time and also two weeks it's really hard to analyze that in depth mm. and my passion now where I've shifted instead of doing so much news is long-term projects mm. long-term investigations and a lot of my personal projects I mean I have an overcommitment issue I mean one of them I spent 12 years on yeah uh, but you know um, sadly no one will pay for that so what I normally try and do with my personal projects is on the back of other assignments, keep doing that. Um, right, keep going back. There. I mean, that's where it's changed. People just aren't, um, don't have the budgets to pay for that right. long-term journalism. So you kind of do it on the side. <laughs> I want to, I want to talk to you about a couple of those long-term projects. But before, before we do, I, I kind of want to know what your opinion is of, um, you know, the rise in sort of citizenship journalism or citizen journalism, whatever you call it. Basically, me taking a phone, taking a snap, giving a comment, and and the way. Like you mentioned there about checking sources, right? There's there's been a great tide in that term and fake news. This is fake news. This has been doctored. This is this is politically motivated. Alternative facts. Yeah, alternative <laughs> versions of the truth, right? And and you mentioned the truth campaign. It's like so we don't have we all see life through our eyes. You know, I will be informed by the experiences that I've had. But someone on the other side of that, we could go through the same experience and see it completely differently, exactly. right? So it's always subjective to some to some effect but i just wonder whether you think that you know there's any risk associated with more people getting involved in journalism who haven't had a degree of training who don't understand the importance of checking sources verifying what you're saying is true and always looking for the evidence so i've been reading some of your work yeah and a lot of the stuff you keep coming back to is ever i wanted to find the evidence i wanted yeah. to get the photographic evidence now from a you know i'm an ex-police officer so that evidence is really key and a lot of so, my work by the way a lot of the stories i've done i've given police because of the access I've had, yeah. there's been even some court cases where my pictures have gone in as part of that evidence because a photograph still stands up in court. Right. It's looking for corroboration, isn't it? You know, so there's a narrative and here's the evidence, yeah. you know, so but, you know, what do you think? So, I mean, I'm obviously a visual journalist. I do write now for The Guardian, with which I've kind of evolved into. Um, but with photojournalism, if I talk about visually, um, it's really key if, you know, I don't know, there's a terrorism attack in London or something and you visually tell the story that you there are ways you need to make sure you get phone numbers names of if you are talking to someone because I will get captions mm. um, make sure I know who I'm photographing mm. um, uh, you know um, if it's a vulnerable person that I have permission to do that mm. am I putting them at risk um, visually as well we can't alter images I can't set up images I have to photograph the moment as it happened because um, as it is a, a seen as a piece of evidence if it's set up um, there's a real issue and I think problems with citizen journalists 
is they maybe don't know they can't set something up and think that's okay because everyone does it on Instagram now, mm. right? Mm. So you set up a picture to make it prettier. Mm. Um, you know, there's horrific stories of, you know, I mean, imagine imagine you going to a crime scene as a, as a police officer and moving yeah. the evidence to just make it look better. You can't, you can't yeah. do that. Yeah. Um, so the fact that people don't understand that and, and just, um, yeah, and just not, the sad thing is, is in some cases, um, I mean, I got told by my old agent a story uh, in se- with the 7-7 bombings in London that um, literally somebody who photographed the bus going off in Russell mm. Square called the agencies within five, I think it was literally within, t- let's say within a 15, 15 minutes of happening and started haggling for money over their images. Yeah. And so it's more like, what's the drive behind it? Yeah. So if they're just setting those images, you've just witnessed yeah. A serious, uh, world-changing event. Yeah. Now, for me as a journalist, I'm like, I want to get those pictures out f- to educate the world. I'm, yeah. I, I don't, I wouldn't even ask my agent about. It's not about the money, the and I think, signing. and there's also a misunderstanding of journalists because sometimes because of all this, we, we've kind of seen as vultures often. Yeah. Um, but not all journalists are like that. There's there's different types of journalism. The journalists I'm working with, the broad, broadsheet journalists, the people who work long-term investigative journalism, my friends who've risked their lives Mm. and lost their lives Mm. in war zones. You know, trust me, we're not paid enough money. A lot of us are doing stuff for free for for that to drive us. We're there because we seek to tell the truth. Mm. We want to understand these very complex situations and educate the world. And, you know, in the olden days, giving you an idea, talking about the old days, you know, the Express newspaper where my mentor was from, they had 63 photographers. Wow. On staff. Wow. Now, there's maybe not even one on staff. We're all like just freelancers, yeah. contracts, right? So that means there's less people going to these places to document them. So you, there's less people. You're not getting that overview in the same way. So it's from their 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 subjective view, yeah. um, as you say. So, oh, that, anyway, it, it, there's a lot. It's, that's a very big discussion. Yeah, the morality of it is, is really interesting. And, you know, and I still, I'm only human. I do my best to, for double check, check everything. Yeah. Um, and what's great about the really amazing broadsheets that I work for, New York Times, The Guardian, they have incredible teams of lawyers. Mm. They double check facts. You know, you get the odd bad apple, um, which, you know, obviously is always highlighted. But if you think about how many stories are produced mm. every day across the globe, how many things have to be checked? Yeah. Um, the Guardian, for example, I'm working on the um, uh, the, the modern, modern slavery section, which is run by Global Development. I have an amazing editor that I work with and we've had real issues with some of the stories that we're doing because we're obviously working with very vulnerable people and trafficking survivors. Um, I love the high level of excellence that they work to just safeguarding survivors because we're aware that this could deeply affect. So I don't think people realise this. So we're about to do a big story and um, we had a story on a girl that was raped by her employee. She was a domestic um, worker in Saudi Arabia. She was raped by her employee, put a video out on YouTube asking for help. And anyway, I tracked down her mother, went to the Philippines, interviewed her mother, and um, she was actually in... Um, uh, I mean, let me correct that. I'm really sorry. It wasn't Saudi Arabia. It was Bahrain. She was actually in the embassy, Filipino embassy, under protection. And we just basically... we Her story was... her. Her case was still active, but basically her grandmother started getting threats. And her grandmother was her, back in a, her grandmother, her, her mother, the grandmother. So sorry, there was a little kid involved. Her mother back in the Philippines was getting threats, right. and we realised we were going to put this girl's case and freedom at risk. Yeah. And even after already investing thousands into a video edit and what we'd done, we actually had to pull that story wow. because it could literally harm the life of a person and I know for the bigger stories you know the Guardian's doing incredible investigations they're upsetting a lot of big industries they've Mm. done everything from just they've I've got probably got to be a bit careful on which story I talk about here but they 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 challenged the supply chain of a huge industry in Britain which um knowingly um had slaves working yeah and they had first-hand testimonies, first-hand whistleblowers, and that industry literally has sued the paper for hundreds of thousands. And that's that's and the, you know the Guardian's fighting for it, but that's expensive, and that's yeah. what real journalism is. Yeah. If you're doing investigative journalism, there's high high risk. Yeah. I, I am so grateful I'm working for publications that are willing to take that risk, but people don't understand that for one story it could cost them hundreds of thousands, and um, you know in lawyers' fees to make sure that things are factually correct. Well, I think that's really interesting. And, and 
I just wonder from a reader's perspective, maybe a younger reader's perspective that, that hasn't had an opportunity to sort of... More coffee. Yeah, keep it coming, right? Forgive us, by the way, if you hear the old bang of Slurp. the mic or the tape or it's, <laughs> the sound effects up because we are tucking into um, sort of brunch here. Um, I hope you don't mind. Yeah, I just wonder from a reader's perspective... I, <laughs> Typically, you think of The Guardian sitting on the left, right, left of centre, and you might think of The Daily Mail right of centre, and maybe journalism as a whole might be might be more centre-focused centre as, as it ever was, in some people's opinion, but you'd still, historically, well, this was always, I mean, The Express, for example, was, it, it was a, a conservative, uh, you know, newspaper, whatever, so you, they have their sides yeah. and the, the partisan sort of approach on, on things. Which but, is basically which, freedom of press. Yeah. That, I celebrate that. Yeah. I find it funny now, by the way, that people are like, they want a very just kind of PC newspaper. We want left, right, centre. Mm. That That is complete indication that you have free press, a democracy, mm. and that's something we should be celebrating yeah. of that. And uh, and um, that's a huge thing because where I've been in countries, and I, I know I've got fellow journalists who've been kicked out of their countries, where it's government-controlled newspapers, right. where it is one opinion and politically correct for that current government, yeah. um, that is a huge indication that there is not freedom in that country. And normally it's the journalists who are targeted first. It's really interesting uh, looking at it, actually, because I always think of it being sort of, if I always read this publication, then I'm always going to have my opinion informed in this way and I'm going to be stuck in an echo chamber, right? I'm only going to be agreeing with the people I agree with and disagreeing with the people. How do I challenge that? But I mean, I, the difficulty is I've sat and I've tried to read the Daily Mail and I've got sort of 20 pages in it before now. I'm saying, yeah, send them all home. You know, <laughs> you know, immigrants are causing trouble. What? No, this isn't my opinion. What? How has this seeped through? How is it uh, happening? So I don't want to turn. But, There's some great writers there. There's some great photographers there. That's They've, opinions, right? So I think the problem is people aren't as, sadly don't read newspapers in that educated way, understanding, hang on, I'm reading a right. a right paper right now or a left. It's, you know, it's always been like that. The thing is now, most people aren't, I mean, if you're honest, are not reading newspapers, not the young generation. Yeah. They're reading news via Facebook, Twitter, whatever, whichever form of social media, and the algorithms are now controlling. Right. So it's even more yeah. filtered. You're yeah. only getting that echo chamber of a very polarised opinion. Yeah. So it's not like the olden days. But, but I think... I wish people, it's so funny because I get this a lot where people are like, oh, you know, because I, I, I'm working for two quite left orientated newspapers. Mm. Um, that, uh, for me, it's not about left and right. I'm mm. working for newspapers that are covering incredible stories around justice. Mm. So, um, would you do a piece for, for, for a different paper if they commissioned you? Yeah, I mean, if I, if, if I felt that it was the right story to do. And I've had my work published across all spectrums of newspapers, by the way, left, right, centre, um, because I'm not just commissioned. I do big stories. And then so it's been, my, my work's been published across all global media from all positions. Mm. Um, it's just the world we're ever living in now has become incredibly polarised. Yeah. Um, and I wish people understood more that, uh, instead of getting upset that if they're reading The Guardian, it might be more left or, as you say, the mail right. When I pick up the mail, I know I'm reading a right paper. So I'm more looking just for the story and not about the political opinion. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also really healthy to be challenged with other opinions because yes. that's the world we live in. Yeah. Um, I may not agree with it. I mean, in my work, I meet a lot of people I don't agree with or really want to be sometimes in a room with. I've met jihadists. I've met... Um, you know, I've been side by side with traffickers, mm. with paedophiles. Mm. Do, I, do I really want to meet, you know, that's hard. Mm. But I also, you know, it's also important that you, anyway, it, it, it's just, it's important that you are challenged yeah. on your viewpoint and on your, on your worldview. Yeah. Um, I think it's really important. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, for me, it's a sign of a free democracy, yeah. free press. I personally celebrate that. Yeah. So. Um. Why you say that? Uh, probably take that slightly differently to before. Maybe I want to know. I mean, bar about... of excellence has to be high. Yeah. And I think one thing about the situation now, with everyone going about, you know, Trump always calls New York Times a failing New York Times, is it's pushed us journalists to push up the bar of excellence. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Like. Um, I think that's a good thing. Do you all subscribe to the same sort of code of ethics? or There is a code of ethics. I mean, I've been trained, obviously, I've had amazing mentors over my life. 
Um, but all, you know, working for that level of, of newspaper, yeah, there is a code of ethics. We're given a code of ethics. And trust me, the lawyers will call you to double check facts mm. where pictures are taken. Did that person know you were taking that picture? Um, so things are really checked. And if you go into a page one meeting, I, I've had the joy of going into a page one meeting in the New, New York Times. You know, they spend hours debating whether that should be the lead story. Um, what effect, you know, it, it, things are thoroughly, thoroughly uh, thrashed through. Mm. Um, so that must be exciting, right? Though, if you uh, think you're going to appear on the front cover, right? Yeah, I mean, I've I I had a story which wasn't meant to be front cover because of an image going on to front cover of the New York Times. Yeah, it's it's incredibly exciting, and I still get a buzz. You yeah. know, every wh- whether it's front, back, middle, every time you see a picture published, it it, it is it's incredible. Mm-hmm. You're like. That is an incredible thing to experience. Um, or now that I'm making films, things to be broadcast, or the fact that people just want to still listen to these stories, hear about these stories. I mean, I'm so grateful to be here today. Yeah. You know, I've, that you want me to come and talk about something I really care about. Yeah. And I feel like as a journalist, I've got such a, a global, you know, I've been in now covering trafficking and slavery in over eight countries as a journalist. So I, I have got... You know, a really good overview of what's happening in terms of, I hate using this word, but trends and especially how traffickers are operating, mm. how corruption works. Mm. You know, first and third world, mm. you know, they still use the same tricks and lies mm. to coerce the girls. Yeah, it may be a bit more advanced in the first world with grooming. Um, and in the third world, it's it's easier pickings, as I say, because, it, you know, with extreme poverty and vulnerability after a disaster or right. it's easy, you know, uh, it's easy to find it's easy to find children or young women's traffic or young men. Um, whereas in first world, it's harder, but it's still the same tricks. Right. It's still, they're looking for vulnerable people. people. Yeah, it's just it? exploiting. So where did that start? Why did you, did you find that you started to want to cover that? Like you say, you spent years covering those issues. You've traveled, you've gone to different countries. You found those patterns, those similarities in, this, in that narrative of, of people being exploited. Why, why that and not fashion, sport, uh, you know, politics? I mean, I have covered those as a journalist. Yeah. You know, I've I've actually worked for Vogue. I mean, I do that, but it just doesn't make my heart beat. I'm passionate about this issue. Um, I think it connects with actually who I am mm. and what drives me. Um, uh, I'm not driven by money. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, don't own a property or anything because of my work. I'm I so I think some key things happened for me in my journey. I'm um, in terms of trafficking and slavery. Very early on in my career in 2002. I, I went to the first kind of big story I did. I went to India, and I had, I was in Mumbai. I started off in Mumbai in the red light district called Kamatipura, which when I first started going there had over twenty thousand women and children living and working. Wow. Um, I've spent a lot of my career in a lot of red light districts and a lot of brothels. And uh, Kamatipura is really fascinating. Um, interestingly, if you look at red light districts around the world, they often spring up around military bases. So some hmm. of the biggest ones that I've been around in the Philippines were around the American base, which was covering Vietnam. You find that, you know, um, and in India, there was a culture during the British Raj where right. they they basically created, um, they call, you know, they created comfort zones. You know, that it, it's something that's it's so interesting. It's it's okay. The men are risking their lives. So they they need to be comforted by women. Mm. And actually, we have found evidence um, in the Indian history of we we found. Um, I was doing the book with an amazing. So my India project, I worked with an amazing charity called Jubilee Campaign, who I worked with for years. And there's an amazing guy there who's a former journalist as well called Danny Smith. And he was looking, he's the one who kind of, for the book, went into the, delved into the history of India. And I was helping with tiny bits of research, but the history was amazing. And we found memos where they were um, asking for people to procure pretty young girls for, for the British army. And even doing my research on the ground, I found a street which, when you translate it, meant White Lane in Kamatipura, in the red light, from where they were bringing more white-skinned girls and actually European girls. And we even, you know, even Japanese, the, the Asian girls into the red light district for the men. And there were memos that the, when they were recruiting the men, they were saying, oh, come, because you'll get access to Oriental girls. So, in a wow. way, the British history in India, yeah. we helped that system. So, European women and, and women from Southeast Asia, Japan. Yeah, we found a little bit of evidence that. I mean, the they majority... They were getting traffic into India. Yeah, but in this lane where it was White Lane, we had that was one tiny part. But the bigger story was, was they were procuring 
pretty young local girls from communities yeah. from communities and actually using local indians to find them and when you go in like one, one lane 14th lane i spent a lot of time in where I had a fixer, which is a journalism term for, you know, the person who basically fixes the story for you. Yeah. He was an ex-gangster, um, long-term five-generation family who were uh, trafficking young girls. Wow. The family no longer. But they, um, you know, some of the buildings on 14th Lane in the red light district have been there since, you know, the beginning of the 1900s. And some of the beds the women were showing me gone five generations through the family. Um, and that was a comfort zone you know, for the British military. They would literally get off the boat and be bought to command. What a Pura. horrible term, a comfort it's, zone. I know, it's Think horrible. Sort of, sort of geographically. Oh, how hmm. foul. And then this is the worst bit. The, when I first went to India, so I went in 2002, and you asked me, sorry, going back to that, like what originally caught my heart? What, what changed my, what, why India? Why trafficking slavery? Well, when I went in 2002, here I was, I went to do a story of why children born into sex slavery. Because mm. because of the caste system, if you're a child of a prostitute, you have no other real option but to become a prostitute yourself. So just to explain that, you mentioned the caste system. I think that's really interesting. So in India, there's a caste system where you kind of have higher castes who are often Brahmin, of, 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 you know, fam it's kind of similar to the class system in Britain. So caste meaning a sort of... Like, often it's, it is colour skin, but it's actually a family name and a family group. So mm -hmm. you've got the Brahmins and you've got like the Dalits, which are one of the lowest castes, who often, um, they're called the untouchables in India, who often are the ones in certain areas will be cleaning out the drains and the sewage. Wow. Um, and so, and they would never be allowed to share a drink with uh, an a higher class cast. Oh. Now, let me tell you something that I find fascinating. So the family I mentioned, um, who was my fixer, he is from a Dalit background. And um, I found it, I find it really interesting that I know that higher castes are coming into the red light district still to this day. They have sex with, they're paid to have sex with a lower caste, but they won't share a drink. How bizarre. I know. Like, you'll do the your most intimate human act. But they wouldn't think of... No, because they're there to use them for their pleasure. They yeah. don't see them as a person. So that ex still exists, right? That caste system yeah. isn't I mean, it's that, purely historical. And that's a real challenge in India, um, especially for the rehabilitation of the girls who rescued out of the red light district. Because if you are a survivor of sex slavery, often the girls are rejected by their families and can't return to their villages. So it's... A, it's re and, and just overall, you know, to just give you some anecdotes, working really long time in the red light district. And you, you know, you probably know from, you've, I, don't, I, think, I, I know you know people in the IJM Indian team. They're amazing. They're advocating for these women and getting their traffickers um, imprisoned, but also just advocating. And these girls, um, I think India is, is really interesting. You know, you've got to realise that um, women are not valued. There's a real issue about the value of women and women's role in society. It's a very misogynist society. Mm. So, you know, with the in India with girls getting raped, the first thing they ask is, well, that girl shouldn't have been out at 10 o'clock at night on that right. bus. You right. know, that famous it's case. Her fault. Right. It's her fault, yep. obviously. Um, one thing that's really interesting, you know, I spent a long time in the red light. I did get to have an off-the-record discussion with a police officer who worked in the red light, which is fascinating that they have their own little police station in the red light, even though prostitution is illegal in India. Wow. And the police would often pay bribes to be in that station because they would make so money off the bribes. And when I asked why, if this is legal, why, prosti I, you know, why if prostitution is illegal here, why are you allowing this? Why is this open? Why are you not arresting all these people? Why is yeah. this an open market? And the guy said to me, you know, this is off the record, but I'm, here I am saying it on a podcast, but yeah. he said to me that, well, if the red light didn't exist, if these girls weren't here, well, then the men will start raping his sister, his mother, and, you know, other women, which are obviously of... But So it's it's okay. I mean, for me, that is just... And, and, and that's not... For me, that's like, no, they're not being paid to have sex. They're being raped. Yeah. Um... So I mean, it's almost mind-boggling. A hundred years later, it's sort of sociologically joke. that mindset. It's no. still they're they're doing that to fulfil an urge, a natural desire, many to have sex with women. Therefore, we provide this service. If they don't, they'd be out raping people. That's the presumption, yeah. right? Which was almost instilled from that, that colonial era. Yeah. Right? We're providing this service for the troops, they for the guys. It. Yeah, yeah. They've got to have their comforts but met. Right? These women, even then, but these women. So let's take Kamati Pura. 
In the olden days, we read, I found out that one thing that shocked me when I first went in 2002, I mean, you need to understand, when I went in 2002, I didn't even know what trafficking was. It wasn't a buzzword. No one was really, people started using that term, 2006, 2007. Mm. 2002, I will never forget meeting my first traffic victim. Um, I was inside the red light on 14th Lane, inside a brothel and fo- taking photographs. And I've still got this photograph. I met this beautiful young woman holding a baby in the morning and she turned to me and she was terrified. She asked me, are you taking this picture back to my village? And I'm like, weird question. I'm a white girl. Right. I don't know where your village is. And I was really confused by that. And so afterwards, we, you know, we were returning. I was talking to my fixer and translator and I was like, I don't understand. That isn't logical to me. And he goes, oh, no, because she was taken by force from her village and forced here. I'm like, what? What do you mean she was taken by force? Because I was obviously looking at family, children being born into the sex industry. And I was like, I didn't realise young girls are taken. He goes, no, no, no. He goes, that's really common. The girls are taken aged, you know, pre-pubescent often, you know, 10, 11, 12, and forced. And then he, he just off the cuff goes, oh, yeah, yeah, and they're put in cages. And I'm sorry? And he goes, yeah, yeah, often the girls are taken, they're put in cages here, and and then they often rape them to break them and then leave them in the cages until their spirit's broken um, and, you know, and servicing men daily, sometimes up to, you know, 10, 15, 20 men a day until the, they have full control of them and that they, they won't even run away. And then he said, you know, the girls you see on the street, because, you know, when I first went, I see the older women lining the street. You don't see, you still see pretty young girls on yeah. the street, 15, 16. Um, he goes, oh, they're the veterans. Wow. Because, um, you know, by that time, they've been in slavery for five, six years. Yeah. So these, and it's common, they've got children locked up. And, you know, and you, it's shocking. Yeah. So the, in the olden days, during the British Raj, they had the cages actually in the comfort zones to protect the girls because there were so many queues. It was actually to protect them. And then those cages now have come to enslave them. And I do wonder, I mean, you're a man. If you knew, because I think it's so accepted, oh, it's okay, you know, if a man has an urge. But I, most men I know are compassionate. If men really realised, I mean, I've had so many discussions with men thinking, you know, I asked the question, if you knew you were paying to have sex with a girl and actually they've right. they've been trafficked, they've been forced to be there, would you do, do that? Mm. And most men I speak to candidly go, I, you know, often without admittance that they would pay for a prostitute, but they would go, oh gosh, no, absolutely no way. But I thought I'm helping them by paying for that service. I'm right. giving, it's just a trade, right? So people do, I, I mean, I'm going to ask that question. Do you, how do you feel as a man with your male friends? Do you think yeah, men really tough. understand? I mean, my, most of my career has, you know, been police and security industry, very masculine sort of male dominated industry. So I would have been with a lot of guys that, that, that have used sex workers, do use sex workers. And, uh, but I've had that, I've sort of put that preposition to them too, you know. So I don't want to be a sort of puritanical, no. self-righteous guy and, and cover people with judgment at all. And I don't think it's always that helpful. No, no. But, I mean, but, but do you think if a guy knows? That, no, exactly. Well, no, if, you, if they knew they are raping a girl, most men I know go, oh my gosh, I would never Absolutely do that. Absolutely not. And, and the thing is, even with, so there are other means, right? I mean, it brings us into the issue of prostitution and legalisation. There's different arguments. Some people say it should be legalised and controlled it's and licensed. Or some people are saying, uh, you know, that's not actually going to help. Uh, but... Uh, you can the idea of it being legalized is that you're giving the sex worker more power, yeah. right? So they have the opportunity, and they can go online, you know, go on a website, and she she can verify you. There's a, an element of uh, interaction before they even come yeah. to your door, right? So they and it can, helps the police verify as well. So I get that, but of, but we you still don't know that that girl is what woman is is operating with complete agency. Yeah. You know, and there the, isn't somebody. Something needs to be highlighted. The majority of women, um, statistically, so this is like really key. Obviously, I've been doing a lot of work around minors by children who've been exploited. Yeah. So if you enter as a minor, how can you be making right. a choice? You're a minor, um, you know, under 16. I, I mean, some of the girls I'm with are 10, 11, 12. What people don't realise, and the shocking statistic, and I believe it's the same as the US, and I've got to double-double check this, but um, statistically from the research and um if you look it up, the majority of women who are in prostitution today in the UK and the US enter the average age they enter is 12 hmm. so how so if you're entering at 12 i i don't i mean it, i find that shocking so my interest isn't in i'm like okay if there's legalization what about these children who are being exploited that's the issue and it's, for me the bigger debate is 
let's look at demand. Let, instead of debating should this be legalized or not, how do we how do we attack the demand? How do we go upriver? Yeah. How do we what are the issues affecting? Why why is there such a high demand? I definitely from South Africa to the Philippines to the U- US I've done stories. I mean I'll never forget a conversation with a madam in South Africa who uh, you know, told me that since the age of the internet, the demand for children mm. has increased hugely. Yeah. And then across the board, you know, when I ask sex workers, why, what kind of Johns come to see you? You know, and, and by the way, you know, I'm not, again, no judgment, just many women are involved with trafficking, as you know, mm. as men mm. in the industry. Um, but when I say, what kind of guys come and see you? And they're like, oh, it's any kind of guy, good looking, young, old. But normally they say, I often get men, they just want to try something out sexually that they've seen online in porn. Wow. And they can't act it out with their girlfriend or their wife, so they they want to act it out with 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 me. And so that says a lot. So I have definitely, you know, I can't, I haven't got tons of research that I can lie, but across the globe, you know, across all the eight countries I've looked at this in detail, I definitely see the trend of firstly demand for children the younger age demand getting higher, but also more and more horrific stories of really dark things that you know S and M that they want to do on the mm. on the on the girls coming from this addiction to pornography, mm. and it's starting off quite innocently, and then men going, "I need to act this out." Well, it's that that anonymity as well, and that sterility, yeah. isn't it? I'm behind my computer screen. Mm. I'm in my safe house. I'm, I'm not nowhere harming near, anyone. Exactly. I'm not hurting anyone. This person's clearly doing this with agency. Well. To a certain degree, uh, maybe if you're looking at adult pornography, you, you're comfortable that what, whatever person do it, they're doing that by but choice. How do we know the age it. of the person? Well, that's yeah. it. But when you get to a point where, like you say, there's there's been the rise. Um, you know, I find it really is one of the things that just stirs me the most and makes me sort of crumble when I I sort of see the stories and read the stories and about the children that are being abused. Um, you know, there's a there's a video camera set up in the bedroom that's connected to the internet, right? And, and well, that's cyber sex, especially in the Philippines. So cyber sex dens, horrific. But even, do you know, I I interviewed an amazing survivor in Sweden who was trafficked by, pimped by her boyfriend, didn't even know she was in a porn movie until she got free and somebody approached her on the street. No way. And she went through hell because they were profiting, you know, she was a traffic victim in a major porn film. Um, do people realise there's a lot of traffic victims in porn? And then these cyber sex dens, I mean, it's interesting what's happening in the Philippines. Again, I cross paths with with, with some of our mutual friends with the IJM team, mm. who um, I did a big, it was actually a film that I did, a documentary, um, went out, um, we were raiding cyber sex dens with the Filipino police force and um, Homeland Security were there from the US. And there, it's become a cottage industry. It's not like big, nasty traffickers. It's actually mums and dads and aunties who think it's harmless to make some extra money. They set up these video cameras in their houses. The people are paying not only just through the dark web, but through chat rooms. Um, You know, British men, I mean, I I saw the evidence as, you know, credit cards and a, a statement, you know, credit cards. Coming, coming from UK, the Netherlands, US, that's why Homeland Security were there, and basically <coughs> paying to <coughs> see me. these kids do a sexual act, either by themselves or over the camera yeah. with each other. Yeah. And, you know, when we were raiding these cyber sex dens, it's shocking. We found on one raid, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, I think the oldest was only 11, and they basically, I mean, you know how it works as a police officer, they they have a fake John and they they set it up. So, you know, they're caught in in the act of buying that their, the kids to perform. But I think the thing that I'll never forget, and sorry, this is I can't I can't sugarcoat this no. stuff. So sorry just to give you a little bit of warning what I'm gonna share, but the shock to go in there and I'm meeting these children face to face, these babies who are the same age as my nephew and niece, nieces. And you go when we did the raid, and you see firstly the camera and the computer, and then you look down and see a box full of giant dildos, and mm. we're talking young children. And then I'll never forget seeing a bin load, you know, big black bin, just filled with sweets, oh. which they give to the children um, for you know acting well. And and then I had to come face to face. You know, we followed the story out there, and I met them. It was the aunt and the mother, and. They're getting in prison. Philippines has some amazing laws. They're going to be imprisoned. Mm. Them begging us, 
you know, on camera, please help us. We've done nothing wrong. We didn't know we we're doing harm. The kids aren't being touched. Mm. Um, it's horrific. Yeah. And I mean, I'll never, you know, and their cries and their, and it, what was amazing, you know, the kids were quite distraught when they got rescued. But they, you know, you're not going to realise your parents are abusing you at that age. But I, I, a week later, we saw them with the IGM team and mm. those kids were already just a week out of that situation, thriving, um, even that short term, seeing that transformation. Mm. But it's just shocking. I mean, basically, well, you realize, as you know this, slavery is driven by the love of money. Mm. It's a flesh trade. Mm. It's not. It, it's about making money, selling humans mm. um, to make money. A drug you sell once, a human you can sell again, yeah. again, 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 yeah. and that's what's driving it. Hazel, hey, so what does this do to someone like yourself that spent such a large part of your life being involved in it? How does that? How has that impacted you? How do you take all of these experiences, some of them you've described and sort of given a disclaimer that they're pretty dark, but to be there in person, to see the child's face and to experience that and then come back to the UK and... London. Then, yeah, right. Um, Lots of coffee places. Can I have a flat white, please? <laughs> yeah, right. Live your normal life, whatever that means, and then go out and take another story. There must be an impact on you emotionally. There is an impact, but... Okay, so I always find this uncomfortable answering this because the people I'm with, you know, it's on, you know, in India, I've, I'm still friends, you know, how many years later, 15 years later with the people's lives I've followed and documented, you see a lot of dark stuff, but it's nothing to the suffering that these, these, which the people I'm, and I go to war zones as well. So I covered the war in Central African Republic and Congo and it has a huge effect on you. Mm. Trafficking slavery, particularly, um, I've probably heard hundreds, taken hundreds of interviews now. Um, but I do find it hard because their suffering is so much more. They're living with that. I come home and I clip back in my life. I think the hardest thing I find is re-entry. I call it re-entry. If, um, you know, it's really hard to combine those two lives. And most other people I know who work doing similar work, either journalists or police officers or NGO workers, long term on this, we all struggle with this. Mm. And, we get secondary trauma and, you know, um, I, ha I, I have had issues with PTSD, um, but uh, it's hard, but it's not as hard what, you know, I, I know think, I think, you know, it does have an effect on you. Um, it's hard to forget people's stories and it's hard to forget the faces and that you want to do so much more. And I try to do as much as I can when I'm on the ground, mm. but it, it, it really, um, things it changes you as a person. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think the things that I hold on to, why I keep going back, why do I keep going back? Because it's really important to tell those stories. And in these dark places, and I've seen some really horrific things, you meet incredible people. So in the darkest of places, I think the shine light shines really bright. And I know that sounds really cheesy. Mm. I have seen probably the worst side of humanity, mm. driven by greed, power, sex, yeah. the worst side. But in that, I've also have seen the inc in that I've seen I've seen the most incredible people the incredible heroes uh people who have risked their lives for others really put their life before uh before themselves and and just people who I mean I've hardly been doing this for any time people who spent you know like in India the charity Devraj spent 25 years of his life doing this yeah. um, and those people inspire me I don't know how they do it right. but also not only that for me it's the survivors you know when you've meet, met a rape victim who was tied to a tree for three months sorry this is really heavy but tied to a tree for three months and raped every day by 20 men in the Congo and they are now carrying a child from they don't know who their rapist is and they're going I have hope yeah. because this child gives me hope that life is worth living yeah I mean, mind-boggling. Yeah. And then you meet just India. I've, you know, followed the lives of some of the girls for 12 years and seen their lives transformed and redeemed from, you know, one girl being held in a cage mm. for five years mm. to the point when she came out into the light for the first time she actually couldn't see because she was held in darkness so long. Her life now, she's married. Amazing. She's um, helping other girls, rescuing other girls. That's her dedication. You're like... You are incredible. Um, that's 
that's why. I mean, it's, it's really, and I think it's holding on to the hope and it's staying focused on the right point. Yeah. Hold on the hope and don't let the darkest darkness overwhelm you. And yeah. at times, it does. Yeah. Um, but keep refocusing back to why and why it's important. Yeah. Um, and also, I think it, the biggest thing is it's made me appreciate how privileged I am. Yes. I am incredibly privileged. Yes. I had the choice whether to do secondary education. Yeah. I am so privileged. I've become so grateful. I think the word gratitude mm. I am so grateful for life. Mm. Um, I've lost friends doing what I do. Um, I'm grateful every day I'm on this earth, and mm. I want that to count. Yeah. I want my voice to count. Um, I want what I do to count, my pictures to make a difference. I don't want them to just be published if they can be used to bring to bring down corrupt organisations. Yeah. If the evidence I find, um, yeah, can expose... Networks, amazing. If it can also raise loads of funds, amazing. I want it to be more than just a story. Of course I want them to bring change. Or maybe it won't and it will just be a story. But even if it just helps one person, that's great. And yeah. I'm not seeing myself... Look, I'm not... I'm, I, I hope I haven't it, got a saviour complex. I don't see myself in that way at all. I just want what I do to have an impact. Yeah. And that's what keeps me going. And if I felt that being a journalist... Um, would I take such high risks if I didn't feel it make a difference? Probably not. Because obviously I think all of us, we're all driven by something. Mm. We want our jobs to to make a difference. One thing I do know, you know, I, it's definitely not about the money. Mm. Ain't that, <laughs> sure. Ain't that so, the truth? Yeah. You mentioned two charities that you work with in India, just in closing. You were talking about sort of searching for hope, right? And those stories of someone's life that was a mess and, and as dark and as sticky and as awful as you can imagine. But actually now, thanks to some organisations' intervention, so, thanks to some individuals' intervention, you know, the, the, that word rescue is so emotive, isn't it? And it's yeah. loaded, but it but they have been rescued from that life. And well, tell me a, very, very briefly, just... just I'm sure you've worked with lots of NGOs, you know, but yeah. I'd love to to talk about the ones I've never heard of. Okay. Who are they? What are they doing? So the one I work with, and by the way, I find as well, especially a Western approach, we love the rescue yeah, because yeah, it's yeah. like, it's that Hollywood it's that story, glamour, right? But, but the majority actually don't end up in there. That's a small percentage. Absolutely. I yeah. work with an, an organisation. Um, the British partner is called Jubilee Campaign and the charity in India is called Bombay Teen Challenge. And it's, a, you know, it's an indigenous NGO. Um, they've been working over 25 years in the red light district. A lot of their their staff are former uh, sex workers themselves, former criminals, uh, gangsters, pimps. And what I love about them is they is they've I mean, some girls that they've worked with, it took them seven years of relationship until they saw the girls come out because you can't force a girl out of, of you know, out. They, they've basically got like a safe house, a safe village. Mm. You can't make a girl go. go. They have to go by choice. And there's, you know, it as uh, with your, your security and police background, um, a lot of these girls don't even realise they're a victim or they've got Stockholm Syndrome. It's so complex. But what I love about this organisation in India is they will spend the years. They're not in and out. Or they've yeah. just got a grant yeah. and they've gone for six months. Yeah. No, they've been there over 25 years. Their staff understand. It's not a bunch of white saviours going in yeah. and rescue them. No, it's locals who care and love. Yeah. And and they it, they may not, for me, it's not about, it's not the thousands that they're rescuing. They've got homes full of a couple of a hundred children they've rescued out, children at risk, women they're rehabilitating. So I'm really passionate about that charity. And that's why when I, I, after, you know, 11 years of reporting on the red light, I put together this book called Taken. It's an e-book. I made it an e-book because I had video, stills, films, um, that it didn't really work in a, in a normal book, but worked really well in an interactive book to make use of all the media. And I decided to give 100% of the profits back to the charity. So if you buy that, which you can get on um, iTunes. Um, it is only on Apple products, I'm afraid, because uh, Apple helped me uh, put it together. But basically, um, if you buy that, 100% of those profits go back to rescuing more children and um, women across India. Um, not only in the rescuing, just but, you know, long-term, long-term work. Long -term work. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I want to do more projects like that. And I'm, you know, that, that but that's kind of my big lifetime project that I've worked on. Amazing. Well, I bought that book a few days ago and, and, and yeah, it sort of consumed me. Um, 
Hazel, thank you for coming in. Pleasure. We've run out of time. I think we've I had think... three, three cups of coffee each. <laughs> yeah, our conversations just sped up as the caffeine sort of had its <laughs> impact. I would love to you, to come back, actually. I think there's loads of other stuff we could talk about That'd and go pleasure. over. So that would be amazing. But thank you for, for coming in. I know you don't always uh, share in this way, so I appreciate that. And I think... You know, you are amazing and what you're doing is incredible. I want you to stay safe, <laughs> you know, keep yourself um, <laughs> safe, but, Do your but, security but keep doing what you're doing because it, it, it makes a difference. So thank, thank you, you for having me and letting me tell the stories that um, I've witnessed. It's Absolutely. Why I do it. My pleasure. Thank you. So there you go. The chat with an investigative journalist. The interviewer became interviewee, if only for a moment. I think I could have probably talked to Hazel all day long, but sadly we only uh, only get the studio for an hour. I'm really grateful for Hazel's candour in that chat. She's clearly extremely passionate about what she does. And like she said, she certainly ain't in it for the money. Proof of which is in the fact that Hazel donates all of the profits raised from her ebook, Taken, to the amazing work of Bomb 18 Challenge and the Jubilee Campaign who are still working in Mumbai with the women and the children from the Red Light District. They've been there a long time, and they definitely sound like an organisation worth supporting. Costs about £8, and it's certainly worth a look, in my opinion. Despite the darkness of much of the subject matter, her photography is actually quite beautiful, and there are some great stories of hope in there too. You can download Hazel's book at the iStore if you're an Apple product user. You can also find out more about Hazel's work at her website, hazelthompson.com. I, for one, will be following her career with a keen eye from now on. Thank you for listening. Usual rules apply. Please like and share the podcast. And if you're especially kind and virtuous, give us a review. Good one, please. On whichever platform you found us on. Thank you to producer Matt for putting this together. Thank you to Soho Radio. Thank you to Caroline. And a thank you to Chris who kindly donated to our Kickstarter campaign to help us put this show together. This podcast is produced by Blue Bear Coffee Co. for coffee lovers with a heart for justice. You can find out more about Blue Bear at our website, bluebearcoffee.com and across all the usual social media platforms. We'll have another podcast coming out in a fortnight's time. Please stick with us until then.